We'll talk here about fractures in children. And if you haven't seen the set of slides on just general fractures, you should probably watch that first as that goes over uh, fractures more in detail. This we're just going to primarily talk about some of the things that we see in kids that we don't so much see in adults. So uh, we're going to talk about the Salter-Harris fracture type classification, mostly focusing on uh, why uh, children get growth plate fractures, uh, primarily that they have growth plates, and what those implications are. And then we'll talk about the supracondylar fracture of the humerus, which is classically uh, a USMLE question and really important to know in general just because uh, the complications and implications of this particular fracture uh, can be pretty significant. So this is a Salter-Harris growth plate fracture type. So what you see here um, is the physis. So the physis is the growth plate. You would imagine it to be kind of like this gray area here. And uh, so there's, they divide it into types one through five. The way I like to remember this is S, A, L, T, E, and R. So type one is the S, and that's straight through. So a fracture straight through the physis is, uh, is type one, S. A fracture that originates above the physis, uh, anatomically above the physis, and then goes through the physis would be the type 2 Salter-Harris fracture. So that's A, so S-A. The, if the fracture originates below, anatomically below the physis, and then cuts through the physis, then that's going to be type 3, L, lower. So now we've got straight through, above, and lower, types 1, 2, and 3. If it goes, if it starts either below or above, goes through the physis, and then out the other side, then it's considered type 4, meaning through everything, TE, through everything. So in this case, we're going above the fracture, or above the physis, going through the physis, and then uh, exiting or ending uh, beneath the physis. That would be type 4. And then type 5 is the uh, a rammed fracture. In, in this case you have, uh, this would be similar to like a, a torus fracture where uh, what you're getting is direct compression on the bone uh, which results in uh, a disturbance of the growth plate. This is quite rare. The most common Salter-Harris growth fracture, uh, growth plate fracture type is type 2. So originating above the physis, anatomically above the physis, and then going through the, uh, the growth plate. You'll also see a lot of type 3 and type 4. So it's rare to see growth plate fractures that go straight through, and it's rare to see this, uh, this sort of torus fracture at the growth plate. This is another way to look at it. Uh, this is just a, this isn't my illustration. I got this online. Uh, so here's, uh, in blue here is your growth plate, the physis. Uh, and that's in the light blue here, if you can see it. And then the fracture is this darker blue line. Okay. So what fracture type would this be? Well, it's coming in from above and then going through the physis. And this would be type two. Here's one where it's coming up from below and then through the physis. This would be type three. So I'm not sure to the extent on the USMLE to which you need to know uh, the difference, differences between the Salter-Harris growth plate fractures. But what you should know is that when you have a fracture of the growth plate, it is quintessential that the growth plate is put back into its correct anatomical position because the growth plate is what's generating the new cells, the new osteocytes for that bone so it can grow properly. And if, if it's out of alignment, then you're not going to get proper growth. Or if it's separated, you're not going to get proper growth. That's the main take home part from this. But there is this uh, classification system, uh, which 
you may or may not need to know for the USMLE. I would say it's 99th percentile material, but um, just definitely know though that if you have a fracture at the growth plate, it requires immediate attention. Uh, and this is a big deal if it doesn't get fixed because it can result in abnormal growth. The supracondylar fracture of the humerus is something that supposedly, supposedly could happen in adults, but it tends to happen in children. And it tends to happen in children, usually early elementary school age, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. And the reason is because children have increased ligamentous laxity. And by ligamentous laxity, I mean the ligaments aren't as strong, they're not as fixed as they would be in an in a adolescent or an adult. So what that means is that the ligaments that hold the bones into the places that, uh, that they're supposed to be in, they're not going to hold the bones as correctly as they would in an adult. So when you think of, for instance, uh, people who are double jointed, that's ligamentous laxity that particular ligament that's supposed to hold those bones into a restricted range of motion is not doing that and so you have an abnormal range of motion. In children they can actually hyperextend their arm because of this ligamentous laxity and the problem is if they happen to fall with a hyperextended arm and of course we all put out our arms into extended positions if we fall from a height if they happen to fall with a hyperextended arm at the elbow they can get this supracondylar fracture at their humerus and uh, this results in a very distinct uh, disorder. So the symptoms as in all fractures are pain at the elbow, swelling, they're not going to let you touch the, the, their elbow, they may be irritable, and what you may see, not in all cases, but you may see an abnormal neurovascular exam. And there is a high incidence of neurovascular complications, and that's because at the elbow, you have a very, very narrow, uh, it's, a, it's a very narrow tube, for lack of a better word. And a lot of things pass through there. Everything that's going to innervate and give vascular supply to your forearm and to your hand is passing through the elbow. And it's a, not, a very, not a very wide cavity. So if you have a fracture, you put all of those nerves, arteries, veins, they're all at risk of, of being uh, damaged. So this is why the supracondylar fracture of the humerus uh, is uh, such an important fracture to remember because there is such a high incidence of these neurovascular complications. Primarily we're thinking of the brachial artery as well as the radial and ulnar nerves. The brachial artery supplies all of the arterial circulation to the forearm and hand and the radial nerve and ulnar nerve, uh, among other things, provides sensation to the hand. On physical exam, when you see a patient who has the supracondylar fracture of the humerus, a lot of times you're going to note swelling at the elbow. Your physical exam should s certainly focus on detecting any possible neurovascular complications. So what you should be looking for to check to see that the brachial artery is, uh, is intact is distal pulses. So you're going to be checking both the radial and the ulnar arteries. And r remember, we normally check the radial arteries when we do a pulse. That's the, the, um, the more lateral artery, the one that's by your uh, kind of uh, proximal to your thumb. The ulnar artery is on the other side. And so you want to check for pulses for both of those because you may have, uh, it, it, it may, uh, it, it, you may get uh, a uh, damage to the brachial artery or in, in limited circumstances you may get uh, uh, damage to uh, just one or the other, the radial or ulnar artery. So you want to check both of them. Most of the times though if there is damage it's going to be to the brachial artery and so you'll have a reduced uh, pulse in both the uh, radial and ulnar arteries. So check for distal pulses. Another thing is you're going to want to check for swelling. That can indicate compartment syndrome, which is a major complication of the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. And finally, you're going to want to make sure that you check for numbness of the hand, and that's checking to make sure that the radial and ulnar nerves are intact. The best initial step if you have a patient with any presentation of a possible 
uh, injury uh, that looks like it may be a fracture, and in this case, pain, swelling, guarding, irritability after a fall, certainly we're thinking fracture, the best initial step is going to be an x-ray at the affected site. So in this case, we're going to get an x-ray at the elbow. Now, if you're doing your physical exam and the distal pulses are absent, meaning distal pulses meaning radial artery, ulnar artery, then in that case, you're going to want to order an emergent arteriogram. And that arteriogram is going to show where the, uh, where the defect is, where the brachial artery or whichever artery uh, is damaged. And that's going to be important for the surgeon when they go in there and repair it. So a little bit of anatomy review here. So here's a cross section at the elbow, and it's just at the level where the, uh, the trochlea from the medial epicondyle and the capitulum from the lateral epicondyle uh, articulate with the olecranon. And um, so this is right around where the fracture would occur. And uh, it doesn't mean that's necessarily where the damage is going to occur, but this is right around the level where the fracture uh, would happen, maybe a little bit more proximal. So uh, listed as number three right here, this is the ulnar nerve. And number four here is the, uh, is the median nerve. And then the uh, listed as number seven here is the brachial artery, which supplies all of the arterial circulation to the forearm and hand. Ultimately, this will uh, bifurcate into the radial and ulnar arteries. The, uh, and then the trochlea and capitulum are here. That's not as important. Um, what, what I wanted to illustrate, though, is just that the, uh, these nerves and arteries are so close to the bone, and so they're at, uh, at high risk of being damaged if you have any kind of, of, uh, of bone breakage. Here's some superficial anatomy at the elbow. So we're just looking in anatomic position here. Again, the, the, the elbow is about right here. Your olecranon fossa is about at this level right here. And um, you can see here that you've got this big brachial artery coming down, bifurcating into the ulnar and, uh, and, and uh, radial arteries. And then you also have your, your nerves here. So here is uh, uh, here is another aspect. Uh, your breakage uh, would happen right around here, uh, uh, roughly uh, just a little bit proximal to the uh, uh, well at the epicondyle, I suppose. Uh, but this is where your breakage would occur, and so most likely what would happen would be that if you did get arterial damage, it would be to the whole of the brachial artery but you can't rule out it just happening to the, uh, to the ulnar artery or to the radial artery. And then uh, you've got your ulnar nerve and your radial nerve coming down here. So just to illustrate how close all these things are put in, and that these children are at increased risk for, uh, for uh, complications both to the, uh, to the nerves and to the arteries. Now the ulnar nerve, when you're doing your physical exam, this is really important. When you're checking for to see if there's any nerve damage, what you're going to do is you're going to check to see if there's any numbness on the hand. And that's because the ulnar nerve supplies sensation to the, uh, to the medial hand, so your pinky and your fourth digit. And then the median artery supplies uh, the uh, the sorry, your median nerve supplies the uh, innervation for the, uh, the middle part of the hand all the way up to the thumb. And then the radial nerve, which we're not concerned about here, is, uh, is going to be mostly the, the uh, posterior aspect of the hand and the thumb. So we're checking, uh, checking the pinky and checking the pointer finger should be enough. Um, you're just checking your ulnar and your median uh, nerves. Okay. So, um, okay, so this is an x ray indicating uh, a supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Here's your humerus here. Here's the rest of the humerus. And here's where it broke. 
And so you can see that this bone, it could be really sharp, and if this were to come in contact with nerves or arteries, it could easily cut through. Here's another one. This is a little bit less dislocated. Again here, you've got your, uh, your epicondyles here, and then here is your, your break. And here's another one. Okay, I could show you these all day. They all pretty much look the same. What you're looking for on the x-ray is just simply a break where you have your epicondyle still in, in, in articulation with the, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the forearm and then your, um, your, the rest of the humerus detached from the epicondyles. What do we do for treatment? Okay, so the question is, is there vascular compromise? And that should be the first thing you're looking for. Uh, of course, you want to get an x-ray, but you should be also, during your physical exam, be looking to see if there's vascular compromise. And the way we do this is by checking the pulses. So if there is a reduction or an absence of the ulnar or uh, radial pulse, then you're going to get an arteriogram. And that arteriogram is generally going to be followed by an open reduction and internal fixation of the bone into their appropriate spots, as well as vascular surgery to repair the artery that's been uh, damaged. If there is no vascular compromise, generally the orthopedic surgeon can uh, do closed reduction uh, and get, the, uh, get the, the bone into its proper alignment. And then it would be casted to allow for proper healing. As mentioned before, it is quintessential to look for complications because the complications are really the major, this is the reason why this is such a big deal, why this particular fracture, why I brought it up, and, and why this is uh, a unique fracture is that it, it's, it's ridden with complications. So some of the complications if you have vascular or neurologic compromise, it can result in compartment syndrome. And compartment syndrome can happen in, you know, it can happen in the leg, happen in the arm, happen in a lot of different cavities. Uh, but in this case, it's going to happen in the forearm. And what you're going to look for is tightness, tenderness to palpation, discoloration, pain on passive motion, because what you're getting is increased pressure inside that closed compartment in the forearm. So this is something you're going to look out for, particularly if the patient has a lack of pulses. And then I um, just wanted to point out uh, that if they do have compartment syndrome, that's going to indicate an emergent fasciotomy. The uh, co compartment syndrome, if it's, already, if it's already developed, surgery alone, internal fixation, or, uh, internal fixation and open reduction, that's good for the bone and you can, you can fix the, the brachial artery, but the compartment syndrome needs to be addressed itself, and that's done by a fasciotomy. And a fasciotomy is simply where you're taking an incision, nice long incision, and opening up the compartment to relieve the pressure. And that will prevent the complications from compartment syndrome, which uh, include uh, permanent disability and a Volkmann contracture. We'll, we'll, we'll look at what that looks like. So this is compartment syndrome. I couldn't find a picture of compartment syndrome of the arm. So this is compartment syndrome uh, in, the, in the leg. And you can see here that you've got some discoloration. It's a little bit swollen looking. And if you tried to bend this guy's foot uh, at the ankle, you would have significant pain. And even if you tried to press on that skin, that overlying skin, it would be really painful. So this is indicative of compartment syndrome. And what we do for compartment syndrome is a fasciotomy. So we, uh, this is an arm here. So what, what we do is we just take a nice long incision to relieve all the pressure. And then this is eventually replaced with a skin graft. So here you can see uh, lots and lots of different uh, parts of the forearm anatomy. Namely, what I want to point out, not that it's important for this uh, disorder, but this is the, your medial nerve right here that's going to go in into your hand. All right, here's another fasciotomy. And then this is your Volksmann contracture. This, so this is a complication of uh, supracondylar fracture of the humerus. 
and also a complication of uh, compartment syndrome that wasn't properly addressed. And it winds up leading these muscles and these tendons to be in a fixed uh, state, and so you get this contracture. So overall, what's important to remember with the supracondylar fracture of the humerus is how it happens. So you got your fall with the hyperextended arm, happens in children due to ligamentous laxity. You're gonna, get, you're gonna get all your symptoms of typical fracture and you need to look out for the neurovascular complications. You get an x-ray as your best initial step, but if you start to have signs of complications, which would be uh, distal pulses being lost, or if uh, distal pulses being lost, then you're gonna get an arteriogram. If you uh, have uh, nerve innervation loss, uh, then that's another thing that you may need to uh, investigate a little deeper. That goes sort of the, beyond the, the uh, scope of this talk. And if you have any questions, feel free to let me know.